Good evening. Welcome to a conversation with the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. I'm your host, Andre Huey. We'll be here with you for the next hour as we engage the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Mr. Timothy N.J. Antoine, on matters pertaining to the economy of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, St. Kitts and Nevis, of course, and the wider ECCU. And so, of course, we're here coming to you live from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank in St. Kitts, and we have with us the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Mr. Timothy Antoine. Mr. Antoine, good evening. Andre, good evening, and let me say greetings to you, all our listeners and viewers in St. Kitts and Nevis, in our currency union, and around the world. It's great to be with you this evening. Definitely. And just to let our viewers know, and those who are watching, that we are live on the uh, Facebook, and, Facebook page and YouTube channel of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, ECCB Connects, as well as live on ZIZ Radio and television. Later on in the program, we'll take some opportunity to give you the chance to call in. We'll give you that number a little later on in the program, so you'll have a chance to interact with us here um, from the Central Bank. Governor, let's start with um, your country outreach. You have been doing the country outreach missions uh, for quite some time. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis is the first one for the year. Uh, what sparked this new initiative by the bank? So it's not new. It's yeah. actually a continuation. Right. The pandemic put a pause and so we were only able to resume uh, country outreach last year after a two-year hiatus. And we were able to do five countries last year. St. Kitts and Nevis is the sixth, uh, but as you said, the first in 2023. Of course, because of elections and everything last year, we gave things a chance to settle here in the Federation, and we're now happy to engage with the new administration as well as all our stakeholders. The idea um, came when I assumed office. We wanted a, a way to engage our stakeholders, our people, the people we work for. As I tell people all the time, we work for you. This is your central bank. And so as part of our accountability to the people, it's important for us to be able to go visit, sit with them, look them in the eye, explain to them what we're doing in their name and on their behalf, and listen to them. Let them tell us. Um, how they feel about the work of the bank and where they think we need to do more, where we need to push more. And so we've always found these missions to be very uh, rewarding in terms of an engagement. Frankly, I find them energizing. So we're happy to be back on the missions. And clearly, since we had quartered here, mm -hmm. very pleased to finally be able to do one in St. Kitts and Nevis. Right. Now, I would imagine also in your engagement, especially in the last few months, or over the past year at least, um, the issues of external shocks would have certainly come up because, of course, we were just coming out of the pandemic, still, you know, feeling the eff effects of it. And now we have this war in, in Ukraine and, and Russia that is obviously exacerbating a situation that was already, um, um, you know, challenging. What are some of the things that the countries have been saying and, and what efforts, if any, that the ECCB has been engaged in to help mitigate the effects of these ex external shocks? Well, Andre, you know, shocks are the story of our lives. If you think about what we've been through in this currency union, um, you know, even the last three years, a pandemic, a volcano in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, now the inflation or cost of living crisis. And of course, we had hurricanes in 2017. Correct. Yep. Irma and Maria. And of course, the climate crisis. Yes. The shocks keep coming. And if we went before that, we could talk about the global financial crisis uh, and so on. And so one of the lifelong challenges for this region is really to build resilience, to build resilience. What is resilience? Resilience is simply the capacity to absorb shocks and to rebound and not bounce back, but as I like to say, bounce forward, bounce forward. That's, the, that's resilience. And so when you look at the theme of our country retreat, one of the things we have in there is propelling resilience and transformation. Because the truth of the matter is, this is the 40th year of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank. And we've made good progress as a region. But as I pointed out last month when we launched our celebrations, we should be further along. And the reason why we're not further along is because of the constant shocks, the boom and bust, the starts and stops, what I call the yo-yo syndrome which means that you sometimes have a lost decade or a lost half decade when you're trying to recover. So look at a simple example. As a result of the pandemic, we probably have lost four or five years of economic output. Hopefully, we will see us return to 
pandemic levels in terms of growth or output levels by the end of this year, next year. But we lost easily four years. So resilience is really key. And to answer your question specifically, I think the biggest contribution our central bank has made to resilience is the stability of our EC dollar. Is the stability of our EC dollar. If you think about all that we have been through over the last 40 years or over the last four years, I think you will all readily acknowledge that one constant certainly has been the stability of the dollar. Unlike some places in the world where you could go to bed tonight with $1,000 in the bank and wake up and find that deposit or your, your savings is now worth $500 because of exchange rate fluctuations. And so that is very important to have a stable currency. Very, very important. Mm -hmm. And so we've delivered that for the people of the currency union over the last 40 years and more. Because mm -hmm. in fact, the peg started in 1976. Sure, when we started the pandemic, the backing of our currency was around 100%. It actually came down because at the time there was no tourism. Um, you know, we were really in a difficult way but it only came down to around 90, 90%, 89, 90%. It's now back up to 91 and it's climbing again. So what that tells us is that this arrangement has really worked for our region. This arrangement to not just have a common central bank, but to back it with strong reserves, the dollar, has paid off, has paid off, and is a key part of the resilience of this region. Yeah. On that note, um we are beginning to see gradual recoveries across the region, the ECCU. How, what are the prospects looking like generally for the currency union as it relates to economic projections and also growth coming out of the pandemic? So last year we grew about 8.9, almost 9% as a currency union. And this year we're going to grow around 5%. And, and again next year, probably around 5 as well. So the recovery is well on the way. In St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, we're expecting growth this year of around 4.5%. Could be higher if the projects start on time, uh, implementation goes well. And the truth of the matter is the growth in this economy, St. Kitts and Nevis, the drivers are going to be tourism, agriculture, food production, digitalization, and public infrastructure. I go back to the projects I just mentioned. Right. Those four are going to be the main drivers of growth in this economy in the next, this year and, go, and going forward. All right. Now, speaking now, you, of course, you, you have a perfect segue into the St. Kitts Nevis economy. Um, you recently did a presentation at the Chamber of Commerce and Industry um, annual general meeting and luncheon where you pointed out that there, are some, there is need for some structural reforms yes. that must take place in St. Kitts Nevis in yes. order to, one, weather the shocks, but also to help keep the economy going. Yes. Could you just shed some light on some of these structural reforms that you spoke about? Right. So when we say structural reforms, we think of things like the revamping of our education system. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. Human capital is perhaps the single biggest investment we could make to change the trajectory of our economies. I've been asking the question um, to our leaders and to our region, our people, what will it take for us to double the size of our GDP? In the case of St. Kitts and Nevis, that GDP is about three billion, just under three billion. What will it take to double the size of our GDP? Well, one thing for sure is skills. So we have to make a shift in our education system from subjects to skills. Skills that actually could get people employed skills that could allow people to create their own jobs. Because I have to be honest, some of what we're doing right now, well-intentioned as, as, as we may be, uh, are not fit for purpose. In some cases, we are training people for jobs that no longer exist or will not exist on graduation, thereby putting them into frustration and futility. We have to avoid that. The skills for the 21st century are known, and that is what we need to focus on. That's one example. Second. The business environment, how long it takes to get things done. It cannot take months and months to be able to consolidate a few lots to start a construction. A simple example, but that's a frustration that many people face every day. If you think about that bottleneck and what that does for the economy, 
you have a loan approved in a financial institution, bank or credit union, that project cannot get started because you're waiting on that permit or you're waiting on that, on that particular piece of in the registry. Yes? Co the construction, the contractor cannot work. That means that person who has to work cannot work. That means that person cannot bring home. There's a whole range of implications that flow from that one bottleneck. Mm -hmm. A simple example, but I'm trying to make it relatable. Yep. To say, that's an example. Another quick example, and I'll just stop there, is with respect to renewable energy. Clearly, to build resilience, we have to be less dependent on the rest of the world for our energy. Our energy security requires us to invest in our renewable energy sources. So we welcome what is being proposed here in St. Gitz and Nevis now in respect of geothermal and solar PV. And we believe that those are very important to lower the costs of energy, which has direct implications for business and households and the public finances, but also to be able to create economic activity. And need I say, to save some foreign reserves. Yes, indeed. Um, speaking now on the general scale as it relates to the ECCU, you would have uh, attended the IMF um, meetings uh, recently, you know, the one last year in the fall, and we actually spoke there about the projections that the IMF had at the time of the global economy and what that may do for the rest of the world. Fortunately for us, uh, that those projections have gradually been downgraded in some instances. Um, but still, we are at the mercy of the United States in terms of how they're going to control recession as well as Europe. Um, are you satisfied that enough is being done internationally to at least contain what could have been or could be uh, detrimental, considering the fact that we are still in the throes of the pandemic in terms of the effects of it, and also dealing with the external shocks of the war in Ukraine? A lot is being done. I think we were a little late uh, in terms of tackling inflation, and that is partly because the initial uh, assessment by some of the, the larger uh, economies, the central banks, uh, was that it was going to be transitory, wouldn't last too long. That proved to be false. Uh, and so what they then found, we all found, is that that is not going to be short term. And then came the war in Ukraine, which compounded that situation. So since then, the central banks, especially the large ones, like the US Fed, Bank of England, European Central Bank, have been very aggressive in raising interest rates. We've seen unprecedented hikes. So you move from zero last year to almost 4% by the end of the year, with 75 basis points in four consecutive cycles to try to get inflation under control. And let me just say this, Andre. The ECCB cannot control inflation. If we could, we would. The truth of the matter is that we are pegged to the US dollar. Most of the inflation that we experience in St. Kitts and Nevis is imported inflation. Therefore, we rely on the US, the Fed, the US Central Bank, to get inflation under control. And so when I saw the chairman of the Central Bank, Jay Powell, last year in Washington, and I saw the vice uh, chair of the FOMC, John Williams, who was the New York, president, New York Fed president in November, I said the very same thing. We're watching you. Please get inflation under control because we're depending on you. So the answer is they've now taken unprecedented steps to get it under control, but it's proven to be very stubborn. If you saw numbers coming out yesterday and today, um, although inflation is trending down, it's still higher than they would like, which basically means that you're going to see more rate hikes and um, interest rates are going to remain high for, you, for, for a while yet until they really have this, this, this under control. Um, so we are, we are really uh, dependent on, on the large central banks to do their jobs. Um, but obviously, we are hoping that they will get it under control. Um, in, 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 you know, this year, to really see it begin to really stay down. Mm -hmm. Their target is 2%. I don't think that's realistic in the short term. But certainly, you want to get it down from 8 and 6% to something closer to 5 4 and then you're trending towards 2 over time. Right. Any possible impacts these, this could have on uh, towards independent economies, which basically comprise most of the ECCU countries? So the biggest fear for us has been a recession in the U.S. Um, so far, the U.S. has proven to be very strong in terms of the fundamentals. So if you look at the job market, uh, the jobs report, they continue to outperform expectations. 
And so there is no sign of a recession in the U.S. at this point in time. Our hope has been and continues to be that the U.S., we would dodge a recession, not have a recession. And at this point in time, we are not projecting a recession in the currency union. As I said, growth of about 5% this year, about 5% next year. We are hoping to dodge a recession by having the Fed get inflation under control and at the same time to ride the recovery of tourism. So while they are getting inflation under control, our tourism is recovering. Our tourism is recovering. So if you look at the numbers in St. Kitts and Nevis, for example, last year, you did almost half a million arrivals. Just before the pandemic, you were at 1.2 million. Then whoosh, everything declined precipitously. And then now you're starting to see the recovery, both on stayover and on cruise. Yes? So we're hoping that as the inflation gets under control, at the same time our tourism is recovering, we could find a way to escape a recession. And one of the things I should add to our recovery on tourism is air connectivity or airlift. So we welcome the announcement by the government here recently of that agreement with Inter-Caribbean. Because in St. Kitts and Nevis, the second most arrivals come from the Inter-Caribbean market. And that market has been very poorly served because of lack of connectivity. So in sum, no recession in the, in the offing, but a lot still depends on what the U.S. does. Right. Um, interest rates, um, and I know we spoke about it on the macro level, but, but looking at it now from um, the man on the street, interest rates uh, are, are things that they tend to complain about. Um, you know, people who want to start businesses are having challenges because, you know, they're not satisfied with the kind of rates that they're getting from the commercial banks and, and even sometimes um, the non-commercial banks like credit unions, etc. Uh, is the ECCB concerned about the kind of rates that are being presented to consumers? And what, if anything, can be done from, from the central bank standpoint? All right, so let's just be clear about um, rates. So there are interest rates charged on loans and there are fees and charges for services. On interest rates on loans, we have seen a steady decline in interest rates on loans, especially on mortgages. If you think about what a mortgage used to be, 10 years ago, you would be paying 8 9%. Now you're paying 4 5%. In some cases, you may be paying as low as 4.5%. Andre, the reality is that mortgages here now, the rates are lower than the United States. A 30-year mortgage in the United States is around 7%. Maybe even 8 We're talking here about 45 Rates have come down, and the rates have come down because of competition amongst our banks. That's what has driven interest rates down mm -hmm. uh, in terms of mortgages. In terms of fees and charges, that's the vexing issue. Uh, there are many people, many of us who are customers, uh, do feel strongly that the banks charge too many fees uh, and charges. Um, and it's a complex issue. And I think at some point I wanted to interview the bankers and ask them why they do what they do. Because it's complicated. I think we all want to see lower fees and charges. Let's agree with that. But there are some costs to banking that, are, that have to be worn. Years ago, when people were in banking, they would tell you, the old bankers would tell you, the big thing was customer service. Today, the big thing is not, well, customer service is always going to be important. But the big thing is also compliance. Not just with the central bank. Compliance with the Financial Action Task Force. Compliance with correspondent banks. Mm -hmm. These are driving costs up. Then you have cybersecurity. As we digitalize, which we have to, you also have to take care of cybersecurity. Cyber insurance. You have to spend a lot of money to protect these assets. That is a cost. That has to be passed on. And then, of course, we have climate. So I'm simply saying that banking is expensive business. And the thing about it is that because we have mainly indigenous banks, that do not have branches all over the region and can spread those costs. The unit costs are higher for indigenous banks than they are for, for other banks. So I'm not making a defense of rates because I think some of the rates need to be uh, re rationalized and lowered, but I do also want to recognize that there are costs involved. What I will say is that mindful of the complaints that we have heard from our citizens, stakeholders across the region, 
we are moving to implement or introduce an Office for Financial Conduct in the Central Bank with a law that would give the ECCB some authority to address the question of fees and charges. Because right now, the law does not give ECCB authority to address fees and charges. We cannot approve them. We cannot not approve them. The law does not give us that authority. We're seeking some authority. So we are preparing legislation to go to our monetary council to provide some pause in law for us to try to address some of these issues. And, and while we're on that subject as well, um, one of the topics that you did touch on at that presentation at the chamber, and which comes up from time to time in, in various uh, presentations, are non-performing loans, which in the ECCU are amongst the highest in, in the uh, Caribbean region, and yes. in St. Nevis, amongst the highest in the ECCU. Um, it's a, cat, a chicken and egg situation, because if banks are not getting their, you know, the loans performing up to par, then they are going to be a bit... Uh, less risky or less risk averse or more risk averse I should say in lending and making credit available and they're going to become more liquid and so you have that cyclical situation um, from that standpoint how do you see a solution a way out um, in, in addressing that issue and, and sort of bringing some clarity to the, the, the situation well, by the way, that's also a reason why fees and charges are higher that's than we would like par partially, yes. because when you're yes, losing yeah. money on interest income loans that are not performing then they try to make it up with non-interest income, meaning non-services. Mm -hmm. um, so how do we see that issue going forward? We think there are some missing pieces in the infrastructure for credit, access to credit in our system. Because as you said, on one hand, the banks are very liquid, but at the same time, people are complaining the banks are not making loans. And the banks will tell you, well, we can't make loans when the ones we made are bad loans. Some of them are. So we have to be careful. And so what we, are, are, what we have recommended, uh, we've implemented now, is a partial credit guarantee program to help small businesses access credit to the, in the financial system. So just to explain what that simply means, in October 2020, we launched a, product, uh, a program called the Partial Credit Guarantee, where banks or credit unions or development banks can make loans to customers. These loans are backed by guarantees, the qualifying loans, between 75 and 80%. So right now, loans are up to $750,000 with a guarantee of 75 to 80% made through your financial institution. So it's a loan, not a grant, it's a loan. But the difference is that because the guarantee is behind it, some people would not normally be able to qualify for a loan, lack of collateral, lack of connections, lack of working capital, whatever, they may now have an opportunity because of this guarantee program. So that's one thing we, we have introduced to help uh, with that. So it's been slow to come off the ground, but I'm expecting this year to see pickup here in St. Kitts and Nevis. And um, well, as I said, St. Kitts Cooperative Credit Union will be the first financial institution in the Federation to sign up for this program, and others we expect will, will, will come. The other thing that we're doing is a credit bureau. A credit bureau is very important. Uh, if you look at modern economies, the US, the Europe, UK, Europe, or larger countries like Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, they all have credit bureaus. And what we know from our research is that wherever a credit bureau has been established, credit has increased. You can't get the economy to grow. You can't double GDP if credit isn't flowing. Credit has to flow, Andre. It has to flow. So you have to put mechanisms, infrastructure in place. So what we are about at ECCB is building out what we call a modern credit ecosystem. And I mentioned these two things. The one other thing I, I'd, I'd mentioned, so I mentioned the partial credit guarantee, the credit bureau. The, the third thing I'd mentioned, and I'd stop, is the collateral registry. What we find is that a lot of small businesses are not getting access to credit because they do not have uh, collateral. And very often, they want to tie up. The bank will ask you to bring collateral, land and other things, and tie up these things. And sometimes you, you don't have it, or it's, I mean, you want a $50,000 loan, and you have to bring in a, a $200,000 piece of land or house. I mean, that's ridiculous. So what we're doing now is setting up a collateral registry where small businesses will be able to use their equipment, 
the inventory, the accounts receivable, as have those formally registered, and those can be used as collateral to secure against credit or to borrow. That is a missing piece in our current infrastructure in the ECCU. And we believe these three things, the partial credit guarantee, the credit bureau, and the, 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 the collateral registry um, will help to make more credit available to our people. Right. Um, earlier you touched on the issues of, or rather, corresponding banking. I know that was a challenge for a lot of Caribbean banks, um, where uh, banks were putting a lot of restrictions or requirements of banks in the Caribbean um, to comply with, because, of yes. course, international laws, et cetera. Yes. Um, we also had situations where banks, and I, and you could probably correct me if I'm wrong, um, Governor, um, a lot of banks would have left the region as well, and some people suspect that it was also linked to the issues of corresponding banking. In, in an instance where we are, where our banks, and especially indigenous banks, are challenged in that sense, how can we have the modern kind of uh, uh, financial system, a modern financial system, which corresponding banking helps with in terms of transferring, et cetera? When we have a situation where banks are taking flight from the region, corresponding banks are not uh, you know, flexible, so to speak, with our indigenous banks, and you know, creating that challenge. How can we, as a region, overcome that challenge? So I think let, let's step back for a moment and just talk a little bit about what has happened with respect to the banking landscape in the currency union over the last four years. We've had rapid changes. We've seen the exit of many of the Canadian banks in the currency union, Scotia, RBC, and of course, FCIB has signaled its intent. That's the bad news. Why have they left? They left because even though they were making profits, they were not making the kind of profits that the head offices require them to make. They have targets. So if you think about it, somebody sitting in a boardroom in Toronto making a decision about investing. They look at their accounts and they say, how much money did I make in the Eastern Caribbean? Uh, 20 million US? How much did I make in the Bahamas? How much did I make in Mexico? How much did I make in Jamaica? Uh, 40 in the Bahamas, 50 in Jamaica, 100 million in Mexico. Where do you think they're going to invest the next dollar of capital? It's not going to be in the Eastern Caribbean. It's going to be in the larger markets where they're making more money. That's just economics. It's, a, it's unfortunate for us, but that's the reality we're dealing with. So they've left because they can get higher returns on their capital in larger, more profitable markets. It's not that we were not profitable, but we are not as profitable as they would like. So they've left. The good news of that decision is that most of the assets in the banking system are now under our indigenous banks. I say good news because it means that the commanding heights of the banking system are now owned by the people of our region. Governments, social security schemes, systems, individuals. Yes? Two-thirds of all banking assets in the currency union are now in indigenous hands. We own it. So that's good. These indigenous banks are not going to cut and run. That's good. And here's the other good thing. They are larger. Many of them are now billion dollar banks, which means that they are more attractive to correspondent banks. So whereas before, one of the reasons why they were having issues with the correspondent banking relations was because they were deemed to be too small relative to the risk, the profit relative to the risk. They're always assessing that, these correspondent banks. Now these indigenous banks are bigger. They are more attractive. So the pressures of correspond, our correspondent banks, that those pressures have eased as a result of our indigenous banks becoming larger. Now having said that, I will say, as a representative of the regulator, that to whom much is given, much is required. So we have a high expectation on corporate governance in respect of our indigenous banks, and we have to continue to monitor them very closely on behalf of the people. Because obviously, the safety of deposits and the stability of the system is paramount. But that's what has happened with respect to our banking system in the last four years. And we have to live with that reality, embrace it, and make the most of it. All right. Well, we are going to take a break at this point. We invite um, you, the public, eventually, when we come back from the break, to call or send in your questions. You can call or send them by WhatsApp at 662-2561. We'll have that on the other side of the break. You're watching Conversation with the Governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, 
coming to you live from the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank here in St. Kitts. We'll be right back. It's conversation with the governor of the ECCB on ZIZ television and radio this Thursday, March 2nd at 8 p.m. Join me, Andre Huey, journalist and communications consultant, as I engage the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank in discussion on developments and prospects for St. Christopher and Nevis, as well as other current issues, including correspondent banking relations, withdrawal of international banks from the ECCU banking system, stability of the EC dollar, the impact of inflation on economic growth, and bank fees and charges. You can be part of this live conversation. Call or send your message via WhatsApp to 662-2561 or via the ECCB Connects Facebook page or YouTube channel. Conversation with the Governor of the ECCB this Thursday at 8 p.m. on ZIZ Television and Radio. Also catch live stream in the ECCB Connects Facebook page and YouTube channels. It's conversation with the governor of the ECCB on ZIZ television and radio this Thursday. Mr. Timothy Antoine, and we've been discussing a wide range of issues as it relates to the financial prospects and economy of the Eastern Caribbean Currency Union, and of course, Sinkis Nevis, which is definitely part of that. Um, we are going to use this opportunity to give you the chance to send in your questions uh, via WhatsApp, or you can actually call directly to the line. The number is 662-2561. Um, and you can also send your questions via the Facebook page and the YouTube channel of the ECCB, that's ECCB Connects. So um, we will uh, continue the conversation, and as calls and messages come in, we will um, bring them live for you on the air. Um, Governor, before the break, we, we talked about uh, the corresponding banking, and of course that the banks um, in the currency union, the indigenous banks, are becoming larger. Uh, there was one commentator, I believe it was in Grenada, who raised concerns. Uh, while they applaud the fact that the banks are now locally owned in most parts, um, the concern of monopolizing and that if all of, most of the banks are becoming uh, locally owned, you may have a situation where a monopoly is created. And we, we know what happen, tends to happen when monopolies happen in a business eco ecosystem. Is that a concern for you? No. Um, with the exception of Montserrat, where there is one bank, and clearly, that's, that's unfortunate, but that also has to do with the size. And Montserrat's population is just under, I think, 5,000. Um, so the second bank, RBC, left. Most of the other countries have at least two banks, at least two banks. Anguilla has two. Um, Dominica has two. Here in St. Kitts and Nimbus, four. Antigua, four. Grenada, four. So I think, you know, Monopoly is one. I think in most countries, you would have at least two, maybe three, probably. That will be the steady state, three. And I think um, that will allow for some competition. But again, these are small countries. So I know people are coming from where they had a choice of five. And now it's come down to three or two. So it's less choice. Accept mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. But it's not a monopoly situation, except in Montserrat, which, as I said, is unfortunate, but the size is the issue there. 
I think beyond that, it is just to keep the, the banks honest, to hold them accountable, which is what uh, we do uh, as a supervisor or the regulator of banks, um, in terms of their corporate governance, in terms of their risk management frameworks, in terms of their, their conduct, ensuring that people who sit on the board are fit and proper. You know, those are things that we, as a central bank, we are responsible for. And so I am not too worried about that. But I do get the fact that there's less choice. That's fact. Yeah, and I think that well, I have a lot of people concerned that, you know, they had this, you know, enormity of choices and all of a sudden now it's down to two or three. And quickly, things have moved fast. Yes, exactly. And in some cases, <laughs> you move from one bank, went to another, only to find out that where you went is now bought <laughs> by where you just left. <laughs> you know, it's like you're yeah. back in the arms yes, exactly, um, exactly. Of, of your old bank. So it, I understand that concern. Yeah. I understand that. Well, we have our first question, and this is from a YouTube viewer. Um, the question is, should a government be a major shareholder in local bank or banks? That's an interesting question. Um, I think governments may be. Um, my preference is for governments to have less influence, but I would never say not to have any shares in a bank. I think there are reasons why uh, governments uh, support banks. If you think about St. Kitts and Nevis, uh, a national bank, which is the single largest bank, with the majority shareholder being government. There are positives to that. Of course, one can argue that maybe with more broadly held shareholding, the bank might have a different character. About half of our indigenous banks now have government or social security as a, as a major shareholder. What we insist as a central bank, as a regulator, is a hands-off in terms of making sure the board is fit and proper, making sure that there's no over-lending to government, so there are protocols around restriction about how much a bank can lend to government, so that there is not um, poor credit on the writing, and that um, they follow the protocols, the, 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 the regulations of the central bank. I think once, once commercial banks do that, the, 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 the ownership is less important if they are following the guidelines established by the regulator. So whether you are privately owned, government owned, or partially government owned, um, the, key, the key is effective supervision, effective regulation. And I think we, we have generally been able to do that regardless of who owns the, these banks. All right, we have a, another question coming in, um, and this also is from YouTube. Um, why is the currency still pegged at 2.7? Most of the region's factories have left. Cruise tourism dominates. Why not 2 to 1 so the locals can keep more spending power? <laughs> uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I don't know why the caller said 2 to 1. I'd, left, I'd love to see the analysis the caller has, has done to demonstrate why it should move from 2.7 to 2 to 1. Uh, there are reasons why it is at 2.7, not at 3, not at 2. Um, so we continue to always look at our, 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 our ratios, look at the evaluation. Are we overvalued? Are we undervalued? You know, those are things we look at internally. But we feel very comfortable where it's placed. And the truth is that the proof is in the pudding. It's worked for the region. The proof is in the eating. It's worked for the region. So if the caller has analysis that can convince us that 2 to 1 is better than 2.7 to 1, please share that analysis with us. We're open to look at it. I guess you're looking at other places. No, but uh, you can't look at other places. You have to look at the structure of our economy. Right. You, Barbados is 2 to 1, but the, the structure of the Barbados economy is different from the ECCU. I mean, we're all tourism dependent, but Barbados do more, does more financial services, for example, in the national sphere than most of our countries do. It has a larger market. So you, you have to be careful. When, and they have some level of manufacturing there as well. And they have, they have limited, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I think you have to be careful with those, with those comparisons. But again, if the caller has analysis that will show, bring that to us. Let us have the conversation. All right. There should be a, an email address somewhere on screen at some point in time so the caller could address. They, they could, right. could or they could send, they could send a, a WhatsApp as well. Um, Good. 6622561 is the number. You can call or send a message via WhatsApp uh, to that number. While we await more messages coming, um, Governor, um, I do want to touch on Dcash. That yes. is uh, an initiative by the central bank uh, to sort of a part of your digital transformation um, yes. uh, process. How is Dcash going? I know you're now, you've, you had the pilot phase and you're now preparing to 
sort of extend the reach of Dcash across the ECCU? Yes. So Dcash has started off, and we are now in eight, all eight member countries. When we started the journey, we aimed for four. During the pandemic, we heard a call to go to all eight. We did that. Um, we have not marketed Dcash well. I will acknowledge that. That is going to change. We've just had a marketing partner, uh, the marketing machine. Uh, they're based out of Antigua and Barbuda. We have marketing agents in countries, in various countries. We have or we are getting. And you will see uh, significant marketing over the, next, uh, over the next few months. And I think we will see more pickup in the use of Dcash. There are some issues that we have to resolve. So for example, we've heard small businesses say to us, we need an e-commerce functionality. So when you, when you pay, you should have a pop-up. Are you using credit card? Are you using debit card? Are you using Dcash? They want that to sort of an API to assist them. We've developed that. So that will come out in due course. And then from the banking side, because we were pilot in pilot phase, we did not integrate Dcash with the core banking system. So right now, you have to call and ask the bank to transfer you know, to your wallet. When we integrate, you'll be able to do that on your phone without any reference to the bank, as you would do with mobile from banking. From the Dcash app. Right, from the Dcash app. So, so that is something that will come. But in the meantime, we've been testing and learning and growing and, and so on. I must say, listen, we were one of the first in the world to do this. Since then, many others have pursued are now pursuing uh, digital currencies. And um, the, the reality is that that is the direction it is going. So we were ahead of the curve. We are learning. And we, all, we did all of this in the middle of a pandemic, I might add. But we are going to get better in terms of the marketing. And I expect to see more people use Dcash. I was very proud when I was in London last year to be able to use Dcash to send, to send, to send currency to, to money to, to a particular country in the currency union. From, from my hotel room in, in, in London. I mean, it, it, it was just uh, amazing to see this go through in seconds. The power of Dcash is there. We have to build that potential. And it will take time. We know that as well. Even with something people have asked for, it's new, it takes a while to build. One of the key things, though, and we also have to say that, we have to get more merchants using Dcash. Because once you get the app, you want to be able to spend, you want to be able to buy. Getting the merchants on board are important. So a lot of efforts have been made. So far, I think we have about 400 merchants on the network. We need, we need a lot more. And, and we, the 400 across, across the country. Yeah, 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 yeah. We need more. We need more. And we are working to, to build. Some of it is also depending on our banks because we have merchants who have said to us, here in St. Kitts and Nevis, I want to come on, but my bank isn't yet ready. So I need my bank because I bank with. X bank. I'm not going to name any banks this evening, but <laughs> banks, you need to move faster as well. Yeah. Um, on the same subject of Dcash, um, you also have cryptocurrencies. Yes. And, you know, people tend to conflate the two and say, well, you know, they think, you know, Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash or whatever currency it may be mm -hmm. is uh, similar to, D to, to digital currencies. So I want you to make a distinction with, between the two. But also, do you see a situation on uh, uh, an ecosystem where crypto and digital currencies can coexist. Right, so let's be clear. Cryptos are unregulated very often without underlying value or assets. So unlike Dcash, which is a digital currency, not a cryptocurrency, Dcash is regulated. It's actually distributed by the central bank through financial institution or agents. It has the full fit and backing of the, of the EC, the ECCB, the balance sheet of the ECCB just as any, as, as our paper or polymer currency. It's the same currency, it's in digital form. Regulated, has underlying value in terms backed by a central bank. Cryptos are not, cryptos are basically speculation. If you look at the value of Bitcoin today, when I checked, I think it's around what, 26,000 thereabouts? At one point it was six or something thousand. The EC dollar has been 2.71 to the US dollar since 1976. That hasn't changed, even in the pandemic. The crypto is up and down, up and down. So they've been used for speculation. There are over 19,000 cryptocurrencies in the world. To answer your question, I think most of these cryptocurrencies will disappear. That's my personal view. Because there is a real concern, and I think you saw it with what happened with FTX in the Bahamas. Well, headquartered in the Bahamas, FTX was all over the world. Um, you've seen it with other uh, crypto exchanges last year. Um, Cryptos have to be regulated. 
because there is real concern that they could do damage to the financial system. The reason why they have not been yet regulated up until now is because they've not been deemed to be systemically important. But I think there's a real concern, especially when you see things like FTX, that the public harm, the loss to customers cannot be allowed to, to go unchecked. There has to be a regulatory par perimeter or parameters for cryptos in the world. I think once regulation comes, many of these cryptos will not be able to bear scrutiny. They will not be able to stand scrutiny by any regulator. They will disappear. And so I believe, to answer your question, a few cryptos may survive. Some of the stable coins that are pegged to something may survive. But I think many of them will disappear. What I know is going to continue are digital currencies backed by central banks. And that is why today, uh, about 70-75% of all central banks in the world are pursuing digital currencies. They're either doing the research, they're establishing pilots, or they've announced launches. Bank of Canada, Bank of England, China, you know, they have all done or are doing digital currencies, like we have done. So I think you will see central bank digital currencies. The key issue really is going to be going beyond, for example, what we've done, the first step of a domestic payment instrument to interoperability to link in these central bank digital currencies so that we can. So one of the challenges now for central banks around the world is to have what we call multi-CBDC platforms where they can trade with each other. And to do that, you need interoperability. And that's a work stream in the BIS, for example, the Bank of International Settlements, to help advance this work as part of the G20 roadmap for cross-border payments. So in other words, uh, someone with Dcash would be able to transact at some point with uh, digital currency of the Barbados or some other country? That, that is a distinct possibility down the road, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, switching gears a bit, and we're, we're going to talk about investment opportunities. And they kind of fall in line also with digital currencies. Um, I know that was one of the focal points of the bank last year for the Financial Literacy Month, the, you know, looking at other ways in which people can invest Mm -hmm. and, and earn from investing. Um, are you satisfied with the investment climate in terms of persons having opportunities or at least educated about opportunities that they can invest, other than just putting your money in the bank, for example? No, I'm not. Uh, thanks for the question, Andre. I mean, the reality is that when we look at the Eastern Caribbean securities market, only 4% of our people, 1 in 25, are invested in that market. Four percent. You contrast that with the United States, it's almost three in five, 60 percent. The average citizen in the United States is invested in the U.S. stock market and generates wealth from the stock market. Yeah, sure, things go up and down, but over time, it has been proven without, beyond doubt that if you stay in the market, you are going to generate wealth. You're going to generate income. So we want to see more of our people uh, invest. We have at this moment $25 billion in the savings, in the, in, the, in the deposits, in savings in the currency union, $25 billion EC dollars. And we want to see more of our people take the next step, which is to begin to invest some of their resources. The basic vision we have at the ECCB is that a customer in any part of the currency union will be able to walk into their bank or credit union, their financial institution, institution of choice, and say to, that, to their institution, I want to put $100 into a mutual fund, for example. And that mutual fund will give them access to both the regional and international capital markets. And it's important that it be both, because the regional market is, is, is small, it's narrow. So we need to have, give them access to the international market. That is possible. That's the vision, the basic vision that we have. And over the next few years, that's what we want to see happen, to the extent where more and more of our people naturally become investors. A lot of times when we think investment, or we think real estate, and we think of business, and those are investment opportunities too. But the financial market is a proven source of wealth creation over a very long time. And this region needs to embrace that market and begin to generate wealth. And by the way, Generating wealth is also part of building resilience. Because the more buffers one has, 
financially at least, the more resilient. Let's look at it. St. Kitts and Neve is one of the reasons why you weathered the storm fairly well during the pandemic is because you had fiscal buffers, unlike some other countries. And generally what we observed, the countries with fiscal buffers, generally speaking, fared better than those without. And so we talk about that at the country level, but you can also talk about that at the personal level. We want to see our people less dependent on government. The government must always help those who have need. Safety nets are going to be important, always will be. But you also want to give people an opportunity to be empowered, to be able to generate income, to generate wealth, to have intergenerational transfer of wealth, wealth and to be able to, to fend for themselves and have the dignity of, of owning and earning. And That's possible. Mm -hmm. But we have to catch that vision. We have to catch that vision in the region. So yes, we have a lot of work to do when it comes to investing. All right, we have another question. This one's from WhatsApp. I'm concerned about the high credit card interest rates. If you're in arrears only for a month, what's your take on this? Well, most countries have a usury rate. That is a rate that is supposed to be sort of the maximum uh, that you can charge. But that typically applies to bank loans. I'm not sure it applies to credit cards. I, 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 I hear the question. Um, of course, if, if, if you've come into a difficult time, like many of us had with the pandemic, I could understand the concern. But I also want to see, while we look at the pricing of credit cards and see how, you know, ultimately that price could come down, we also need to promote the responsible use of credit cards. You know, my wife and I were counseling a, a, a an engaged couple over last weekend, and, 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 and we were discussing finances, and you know, they said to us, they don't have any credit cards. So really, good? And why? Because they just feel strongly that credit cards could be abused, and so they've decided not to have. Now, I'm not telling you not to have, because for some of us, credit cards are necessary. I mean, you travel these days, you, you almost can't get a hotel or get a, without a credit card, exactly. right? So, but the issue is not the credit card, it's the use of the credit card. In the discipline. Yeah, and that's where a lot of, we have to do a lot of work in financial literacy. Because the truth is that some people take a credit card, see it as easy credit, decide to operate on a minimum payment. Well, if you do that, you're going to, if, you, if you're poor, you're going to stay poor. And if you had any means, you're going to get poor. That's a sure way to get poor and stay poor, using a credit card that way. So we have to educate our people as well on the use of credit cards how they're supposed to be used. But uh, I think I'd have to look into this matter of what the, the fees, the cap, if there's a cap on credit cards. I don't think there is, because I don't think the usury rate applies, but I need to have that checked. Okay. We do have another question. What qualifies someone to serve on the board of directors of a bank? Are these qualifications being adhered to in St. Kitts and Nevis? So under the Banking Act, uh, an uh, amendment that was made a few years ago. Uh, that amendment has not yet been passed in St. Kitts and Nevis, but we expect it will be passed, um, I expect, this year, based on what we heard from government recently. There are fit and proper criteria for somebody to serve on a board. And those nominations or those persons who are being put up, that information has to be submitted to the central bank. And the central bank has to give an opinion on whether or not that person is fit and proper. So you look at their background, you look at their competence, you look at are they bankrupt or not, you look at their police record, you look at a number of things to establish whether this person is in a position to sit in oversight of your money or my money. So in several of our countries, I think five, six of the countries, that amendment is no law. It is not yet law in St. Kitts and Nevis, but it will be. And uh, that is very important. And in the context of indigenous banks owning most of the banking assets, mm -hmm. remember what I said, too much is required, much is expected. That's corporate governance I was getting at. Yep. You have to ensure that the right people are sitting on the board, and you also have to, write it, you also have to ensure you have competent management. If the, bank, if the central bank has an objection or has concerns about a nominee, uh, a person who is nominated to be on the board, mm -hmm. um, but the bank goes ahead nonetheless and... and they can't go ahead. Um, we, we can take them, hold them to account and their, their, their actions there. What can happen though, if the person, if the bank says no, based on our assessment, this person is not fit, not proper, the person has an opportunity under the law to make a case 
for us to reconsider the position. So maybe there are things that they can bring to the table that we are unaware of to show, well, you know, I actually, I am suitable. And we, we will have to hear that. So that's the due process or the natural justice mm -hmm. built in there. But a bank simply can't ignore the central bank, the regulator, and go ahead and put, and put somebody on a board. Okay. Does the ECCB do a te te technological and digital audit of the regions, of the region's banks? Yes. So part of our, so we do what we call these on-site examinations, where we actually go into the bank and we do, we spend 10 days, two weeks, whatever. It depends on the scope of the, of the examination. Um, and sometimes we, we focus, if we go in just to IT, we will go in and deal with IT. But typically, if we do not full scope, IT is always included. So we actually have persons who go in and look at the IT systems, look at the setup, and actually comment and give recommendations for improvement, for remediation of the current arrangements. We have also recently, just uh, in a couple months ago, issued for discussion an ultimate enactment, a technology standard, a technology standard for our licensed financial institutions. So that is a very important issue, and we do, we do look into it when we go into the right. banks. We do have our final question on WhatsApp. The food import bill is a major problem for us in the region. What steps are the ECCB uh, taking to assist in this regard? Well, I think the first thing for us, Andre, is advocacy. So what we've done is to use our platform to say, hey, food security is an important issue, and it needs to be addressed. Uh, we found and I have said this repeated in the last few weeks, a survey by CARICOM and the World Food Program indicated that about 57%, this is CARICOM wide now, not just ECCU, 57% of our people are dealing with either moderate or severe food insecurity. That's a big issue. And in the context of inflation, that obviously has made it a, little, a lot harder for households to be able to deliver not just food, but healthy food. And then you tie that to the problem we have with NCDs, non-communicable diseases, where we eat in ultra-processed foods, which are cheaper, but they're also killing us. And that is a real challenge for our region. Advocacy. Second, we have established the Partial Credit Guarantee Program, which is a way of giving access to credit, including for farmers and fishers. Yes? So we see people in food as being able to benefit from this program to expand their businesses. And three, we've established through our research statistics and data analytics department, led by Teresa Smith, we've established a food tracker, which basically is a way for us to, to see how we are doing and to hold our governments accountable. And by the way, we said, if we're going to hit the target or get even close to the target of reducing our food import bill by 25% by 2025, we must tackle three categories in particular, meat, Grains, which includes breakfast products, cereals, and so on, mm -hmm. and fruits and vegetables. If we're going to tackle that bill, we have to tackle these three. And those are some of the highest That's the categories. big three. Yeah. They're over 50% of the basket. That's the big three in the food yeah. import bill. Well, Governor, we're out of time, so I'm going to give are you... Are we? The, yeah, we are. My goodness. <laughs> time flies. That went very quickly. Uh, yeah, well, I'll give you the opportunity to, to wrap up uh, with your final words. Well, just to say, Andre, I, I enjoyed having this uh, interview, this encounter with you, this engagement. Um, we thank those who came with their questions. Uh, we remain open to ideas, suggestions for how we can improve. As a bank, we, we want to remain humble about what we do and how we can get better in serving the people of our currency union. We love our region. We love our people. It's an honor to serve them. And we want to do the best we can for the people of our region. So I want to encourage everyone to continue to stay engaged this year is our 40th year. Congratulations. We have a, thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a wonderful calendar um, of events throughout the year. The, the committee has been working really hard, chaired by our deputy governor. We've rolled out the calendar, and we want you to get involved. You will start hearing from next week a Did You Know series, for example, educating you about your bank, your central bank. And we hope that we will build a consciousness and awareness, and most of all, a commitment of collective action, for collective action. Because as I always say, we cannot change our history. We cannot change our geography. But we can elevate our development trajectory through innovation and collective action. And we must do that the best way we can. 
Governor, thank you so much for this opportunity and for having this conversation with us. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. Yes. And thank you, the viewers and those who participated in the discussion, uh, sending in your questions. Thank you so much for being a part of conversation with the governor, the governor of the Eastern Caribbean Central Bank, Timothy Antoine. I was your host, Andre Huey. Thank you so much. And I guess we will have another conversation soon um, in another territory, of course. Look forward to that. Yes, yes. we have to do Antigua and Barbuda and Dominica this year. Okay. And let me thank all of the team at ECCB. They've been great. They work hard. Thank you, team, for your support. Thank you very much. And do have yourself a pleasant evening. Is here, everybody must be aware. The cash taking is the digits, and you don't need to use money physically. You could use your phone to send, receive, and so much more. The cash save and fast for cheaper, so get it up on your mobile phone. Everybody rolling now with the cash. Everybody rolling now with the cash. Everybody rolling now with the cash. We spend it easy, and as digital, they rolling now with the cash. Everybody rolling now with the cash. Everybody rolling now with the cash. We spend it the easy dollar is digital. Make payments safer, faster, and cheaper with Dcash.